Hi everyone, Melanie Layton here, CEO of Titan Minerals. Um, Titan Minerals is an ASX listed explorer and developer with projects in Ecuador, ASX ticker code TTM. Uh, we've got large scale copper and gold projects in Ecuador, Dynasty Gold Project, the our most advanced asset, and the Linderos Copper Project. We most recently did a deal with um, Hancock subsidiary company Hanrine for them to earn up to 80% for $120 million US spend. So pretty well placed with great exposure to both copper and coal in southern Ecuador. Fantastic. Marilyn, lovely to have you on the show. First time um, for that. Um, can you can we start off and uh, talk about you? Uh, where, have you? where are you from? What have you done relevant to what you're trying to do now? Yeah, um, no problem, Matthew. I'm a geologist. i um, been in the industry for a little over 20 years. Uh, cut my teeth in Archaea and Gold in Australia, Western Australia. Um, our chairman, Peter Cook of Titan Minerals, I worked with several years ago at a, at a mine called Hill 50 Gold back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So um, certainly a geologist with a lot of experience in gold. And then more recently, uh, I was with Hot Chile for a little over 10 years, um, exploring and developing the um, Costa Fuego um, project, so product or a Cordadera projects in Chile uh, on the coastal range. So uh, I guess that's my experience in terms of copper and gold uh, and in Australia and, and Latin America, largely in my more my later career. Right. We know the hot chili guy as well. Um, great project. Um, and can we talk about some of the rest of the team, like uh, in terms of like not just the nameplate guys, but the, the people actually doing things on the ground? Who have you got? Yeah, definitely the team on the, de on the ground are really important um, and very much driving, I guess, the operational um, side of things. So Mike Skeed is our chief technical advisor. He's um, based in Nova Scotia. A lot of experience with um, both copper and gold exploration and particularly in emerging countries. So Mike spent um, over 12 months. Um, we acquired the projects back in 2020. Mike spent 12 months in country following that establishing the team, um, setting up the systems, the protocols. Um, so sort of we've got really good systems in place. We've got fantastic warehousing of all of our, I guess, our diamond core and our pulps and our database and the like. And also he has selected the team in country. So Pablo Morelli is our exploration manager. He's a Chilean geologist, also around 20 years experience. Um, worked for some of the majors for Barrick, Newmont, um, and again, considerable experience in epithermal gold and copper porphyry exploration and development um, and into mining as well. So really well credentialed team. Um, and Pablo is effectively, you know, our country manager and, and very much driving the, the strategy um, in country and, and um, you know, keeping the team in check over there. Brilliant. Okay. And then let's talk about, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to hit a few like um, of, of the variables that people need to understand before they can sort of you know, think about starting to invest, which, is, and the next one on the list for me is um, country Ecuador. Obviously, we've seen um, groups like Ad Adventus um, perhaps having to just, just take a little, it's taking a little bit longer to kind of get to where they want to be, but the kind of um, elections of sort of 18 months ago, new guy in charge, um, I think new, new general elections coming up in February next year. Um, what's the reality of trying to do business on the ground politically? Yeah, politically, the government is um, extremely supportive. So President Nabal was elected late last year. Uh, he attended PDAC earlier this year in March. He got up and he presented to the crowd and he basically said, you know, for his ministers, um, permits, um, environmental permits approved is a KPI that he would like to see achieved. Currently, um, in Ecuador, mining represents sort of 1% to 2% of GDP. Uh, so Frida del Norte operation, which is London Gold, uh, Mirador Copper Mine, they are both operating mines in Ecuador and they represent, um, you know, really good revenue for the government, but they know that mining is a big part of their, I guess, the way to revitalise the economy. So they're very supportive of mining going forward. And, and I, when I say mining, I mean responsible mining. Um, so they're offering all sorts of investment protection agreements for both exploration and exploitation for companies that are exploring and mining within Ecuador. So, and, and I think because of that, we are seeing a number of the majors that are significantly invested in country as well now. So a critical massive investment, um, you know, that probably Chile started to see 30, 40 years ago, Ecuador is now starting to see the fruits of that that same type of investment as well with the, the new months and the barracks and, and the first quantums and, and the big guys in country. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think it's interesting sort of looking at the Londines project for Tetum Nor Norte um, shows you mm -hmm. what is possible and perhaps even the government what's possible in terms of the revenue it, it creates. Um, okay, well, let, let's get on to the projects proper. We better start, start off with uh, Linderos. You obviously mm -hmm. um, talked about uh, the, the deal, maybe to get into the kind of structure for us and also for those who perhaps aren't aware um, who that involves. 
Yeah, so look, we have four projects in Equinor. Um, Linderos Copper Project is one of our three copper projects. Um, look, we we have done some, I guess, preliminary exploration and some drilling ourselves, which we did back in 2021-22. We demonstrated poor from mineralisation from extremely shallow, shallow depths. Um, Hancock Prospecting obviously liked what they saw. They approached us. Uh, they undertook a site visit. They reviewed our data and we entered into very indicative terms with them um, back in May, uh, sorry, a little bit earlier than that, April. And um, so it's a staged earning agreement for them to earn up to 80% of our project for a total investment of 120 million US or to get to a point of a decision to mine. There's a US $2 million upfront cash payment for 5% of the project and then a staged earning at an additional 10,000 metres of drilling for the next earning phase and then an additional 15,000 metres on top of that, at which point they will have earned 51%. And there's another US $1 million cash payment there. And then once they've reached the full 120 million or the decision to mine, um, that's when they earn the 80%. And we're free carried to that point, at which point we can elect to contribute pro rata um, once we we're at that 80% and um, that they've earned. And if we do not, if we choose to dilute below 10%, then it reverts to a 2.7% NSR across the project. So regardless of percentage ownership, um, at that point, 2.7% NSR is a very healthy um, exposure to what could be a really meaningful scale um, copper project. Right, okay. And um, so over what timeline, I didn't quite see that in the documentation. Yeah, um, sorry. So it's two years for the first 10,000 metres of drilling. And then five years, up to the five years for the additional 15,000 metres of drilling. And then the total investment up to 12 years to get to that decision to mine, which I think is not unreasonable considering the scale of the project we could be um, considering here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, fine. So um, that, that you've got free carry to that point and the ability to convert to a 2.7% uh, NSR, great. Okay, I'm totally understand. And I, th I think we're seeing a lot of, lot of companies having to, you know, think about, you know what they're capable of doing. Obviously, balance sheet uh, required for something like this is 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 immense. Uh, it's also given you um, what two million bucks initially, and then there's a later payment of a million bucks um, once they get up to fifty one percent. So those sorts of things help you do what you want to do on the ground, and I guess less less dilutory. You've talked about the the focus for you would be dynasty. You've also got Copperfield and Copper G. Copper G. I, I think I, I know a little bit about. Um, tell us about why you focus on Dynasty. Well, Dynasty is a gold project, and we ha already have resources established there: of 3.1 million ounces of gold, 22 million ounces of silver. Um, and considering, you know, the gold price and the sentiment, and even the silver price as well, has been appreciating quite considerably of late. So, I think it's the right environment now for us to keep progressing forward with the Dynasty Gold project. So, the 3 million ounces of gold is contained within a nine-kilometer epithermal corridor, on which I would say maybe half has been effectively drilled uh, and quite shallowly drilled, in fact. So there's resource uh, extensions that are um, really quite probable at depth. And then also there's significant gaps within that corridor that have not seen any exploration or drilling. Um, and we, so we believe that the 3 million ounces could quite quite easily grow to 5 to 6 million ounces, and that's what we're targeting. Right, and, and so what, what grades are we talking about? 2.23 uh, is the average gold grade and a little over 15 grams for the silver grade, so pretty decent grade um, considering it extends from surface. So there's no pre-strip. Um, it, it all extends from surface at the project down to a depth that's been designed to find down to about 350 metres vertical. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. so relatively shallow. Any, any kind of um, – well, tell us about the ore body itself, what do you know? Yeah, well, it's an epithermal um, gold and silver um, rich, I guess, deposit. Um, at this point in time, with the level of drilling that's done, 66,000 metres of diamond drilling. Uh, we're sitting at about 40% indicated, 60% inferred. Um, we did some drilling late last year in terms of targeting some of those extensions to the resources. A fairly modest um, drilling program of about 5,000 metres, and we did define new mineralisation, and we also um, probably upgraded the confidence in the geological model in other parts of the project as well. So we are working towards a resource update or upgrade in the coming month or so. I was hoping to have it out by the end of June, but I think um, the level of complexity within the geological modelling and the real rigour that we're using to establish the model, it'll be more likely July that we get that resource update out. Right. So that's certainly what we've been working towards. Okay, fantastic. And, and in terms of... Um you'll want to move more of the uh, inferred into the indicator category, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. 
because I mean, three million is, 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 that, that, that's a that's a kind of good good start. But um, these days, you probably need to be you know showing the market the, the the size and the scale of this potential. Would you? And if you're able to do well, let's focus on what are you going to try and demonstrate with the new resource. What's important well, to you? I guess what we're trying to demonstrate is with the very modest amount of drilling that we did, that there is the potential to um, grow the resources um, and then with our improved geological modelling. So we've spent a lot of time, a lot of boots on ground exploration. So all of the resources and the mineralisation extends to surface. So we've been able to map it at surface and then connect that to drill holes at depth as well. So it gives us a really robust geological model, which then feeds into a, a you know a robust and a good confidence resource which then also, um, you know, enables you to really have some detailed studies with some some a good understanding of the ore body and the way that you would go about mining it and the advanced rates and and the methodology there. So I guess that's the next step for us. Once we've um, you know done this next resource update, it really is about getting into some of those feasibility work streams as well. Right, and and with regards to your the, the the company's business model, obviously we've seen what you've done. You've described Lenderos. Um, type of structure. Are, do you describe yourselves as explorers and therefore wanting to then continue to utilize that model? And so at some, at some point, Dynasty gets farmed out to someone else, someone tries to farm into it, I should say. Um, or is this something that you feel that you can sort of move through to, you know, further down the line? I think we definitely can add a huge amount of value still to Dynasty ourselves. Um, it is still underexplored. And like I said, the 3 million ounces, we think we could grow that to five to six and through our targeted exploration. And that's more, you know, our boots on ground exploration, identifying those new car- targets, which we started to do already with our soil geochemistry and our mapping. And then in the second half of this year, we'd like to launch back into drilling and start demonstrating what the scale of this project could be and that doesn't necessarily mean we have to have it all drilled out to an indicated or measured status it just means some targeted holes to understand what the scale could be Um, and then you've got kind of the concept for the scale of the operation that you'd be targeting as well so I think following that drilling in the second half of this year we'd be really well placed right and but ultimately you're not mind builders this would be something that you'd look to monetize in some way shape or form we would absolutely have to up, up 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 our team and our skill set if we wanted to build it ourselves. But it's not to say that it can't be done. Um, but I guess the way that we're doing things in terms of best practice, the way that, that we're collecting the data, the way that we're conducting our business, it could be us if we end up going that path, or it certainly would be an attractive proposition to anyone else. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't. I mean, we've seen lots of companies sort of um, having to rethink the way that they kind of come at financing because mm. I think you know. Quite frankly, there's lots of CEOs come and say, "Hey, the junior exploration model's broken. The financing's not available. The big guys yeah. like to do mergers of equals. You know, you know, be assured of production resources reserves. Um, you know, for for the for their for their own balance sheet. But it leaves the little guys a little bit caught short. So, people thinking of new ways to minimize the dilution and be able to continue to expand projects. It's fine. I'm just intrigued." Uh, by what companies choose to employ. I mean, you must have had to sort of, I guess, at some point, you've only been there since what, the beginning of last year? So that sort of yeah, time frame? Yeah, I say, I say months, yeah. Yeah. Right, and was that was that part of the conversation before you came on board or even after you came on board in terms of, you know, how, how do we tackle this market? Because it's been tricky out there, right? Yeah, well, it has been tricky. And I think, you know, the last 12 months, um, you know, when I initially, my first 12-month term was a pretty tough one. You know, there was not many doors that were opened I, you know, wasn't many people willing to listen to people with gold or copper projects, particularly sort of junior and mid-tier guys. And I think the sentiments largely is starting to change, but I I agree with what you say. The majors and the big guys don't really want to take on any assets if they've got too much risk. They want to know what it really is. Um, And so that's kind of why, why I said to you, I feel like we've got a lot of value still to add through our exploration and some some of those development work streams might not necessarily mean we have to take it all away, but we just need to demonstrate what this could be. And I think that we've got the right skill set and the right team and some really key technical advisors uh, and consultants that can help us do that. Yeah, no, no like I say, it, it, you know, all, all of the above, above is good. It's just, you know, I think people want to sort of see and hear the CEOs um, a clearly articulated um, plan because it's it feels like. Um, it's something, something's got to give, and you know, and I kind of like like what you're doing. 
Um, well, let's 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 and, and talking, let's 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 talk about what you're going to be doing because it's all about growth. So, what what do we see over the next 12, 18 months? Yeah, 12, 18 months at Dynasty definitely is drilling and growing the resource, and then probably improving the classification, particularly in where we feel the startup area of the resource is. So, the Cerro Verde prospect at the Dynasty Gold Project contains 1.9 million ounces of gold, and that does look to be. Um, what will um, support a very large open pit followed by an underground um, long hole stoping operation. So we've got a bit of an understanding about where those initial pits will want to open up and the you know the optimal grade or the cutoff grade looks to be about, about 0.5 grams per tonne for the open pit, about 1, 1.5 grams per tonne for the underground. So we're getting a bit of an understanding of the economics and really where to target our focus for the resource conversion and the resource growth inside those pits. So um, we've got a really good framework that we're working towards, um, you know, to grow and de-risk the Dynasty Gold project in the coming 18 months. And we've just commenced some preliminary metallurgical test work as well to understand what that flow sheet will look like um, and also to understand what the optimal sort of throughput will look like in terms of economics. So we're working on a number of things behind the scenes to continue to progress this and de-risk this project. Right. And uh, like I say, you've got like four projects in the portfolio. We, we know we know what you've done with Linderos. We know what you're going to do with the Dynasty. Just in, just in terms yeah. of the, because I think small small companies having a big portfolio is great in terms of de-risking, but it's also liability in the sense that you you got to spend money and advance those things. So, uh, with regards yeah. to alternative strategies, what, what do you what do you do with the other two projects? Well, fortunately in Ecuador, you don't really have to spend money on all your projects. There's no kind of use it or lose it policy. You do have to pay your annual um, mineral tenement concession fees, um, but outside of that, you don't actually have to spend money. So, Copper Duke, we've done a a considerable amount of, I would say, low-cost work, but we've um, improved our understanding drastically since acquiring the project in 2020. So we've we've collected regional soil geochemistry, we've collected regional aerog magnetics, we've done a lot of mapping and a lot of trenching. We've actually identified some really key targets which we would like to get on the ground and drill test. Um, we are conscious of the fact that it's a seven-kilometre pore-free system. Um, it's a big system. It requires it will require a lot of drilling and it will also require a partner in the longer term. So I guess we have been running a strategic process um, looking for a partner for this project and we, um, I think we're pretty advanced and we have conducted a number of site visits. We've had overwhelming um, positive feedback from, you know, most of the majors and the guys that have been to site that um, the technical merits of the project, they, you know, they really like it and the work that we're doing as well in terms of developing our understanding and collecting those foundation geological data sets and the way that we, you know, warehouse and present at that information they're really impressed with. So I think it's only a matter of time until we find the right partner for that project. And it could be Hancock. Again, you know, it might be the same partner that we've secured for Linderos. But um, I think so that that's a strategy for us is to find the right partner. But I think also we managed to do the deal on the Linderos Copper Project after doing about 4,000 metres of drilling ourselves. We demonstrated what the opportunity could be there. And that might be something that we look to do for Copper Duke as well because, like I said, majors don't really like a lot of risk. They like to have a bit more understanding. They're prepared to pay more for it as long as the, the risk has been taken out of it. So that might be something that we look to do for Copper Duke as well in the second half of this year, just to put some well-targeted holes in to understand what the opportunity could be there. Great. Appreciate you explaining that. And, and also maybe just for um, some of the audience who perhaps don't necessarily fully understand or appreciate that kind of model. Can, can you explain why for juniors, junior exploration companies, it's probably sometimes better to let companies kind of farm into um, projects and for you to kind of get one carried through the process. And if there is, if, if there's somewhere maybe explain that why that's more valuable um, to you as a, as, a, as a company, whether it be through the NSRs or whether it be through you know, ultimately holding 10, 20% position. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, the ultimately these poor free projects, they're, they're large and they require a significant amount of work to explore and develop and to build. Um, you know, you're talking about multi-billion dollar capexes sometimes and you, you can take Sol Gold's Cascabel project in the north as, of Ecuador as an example. I mean, they're, they're, they've got massive NPVs in the end, but ultimately they require a substantial amount of capital up front. And there's no way that a 50, 60 million market cap junior can can um, can fund that. We just can't do it through debt or equity. So you certainly need a partner for these projects. So I think our value add is in the early stage in our exploration, um, you know, project generation role. 
and the early work that we can do to demonstrate what the opportunity is to find the right partner. Um, and so I think we've done that once with, um, with Lid Daros. I think Copper Jute would come next. And then we also have Copper Field, which is our third uh, copper project as well. And then I think even beyond that, we are looking you know, regionally at what other opportunities are in Ecuador as well at this point in time, because we've been there for several years now. We've really established our um, exploration regime and procedures, and we know what really works well for us. Um, we've really honed that skill, and we've got a, a really good team in country. Um, so, yeah, we should just make the most of that and continue to keep our eyes open for other um, you know, early stage projects where we can really add our value. Okay, and then just just on that point, actually, um, again, de-risking projects is you know part part of the name of the game. But you know, de-risking some companies choose choose to de-risk geographically. I they say, well, okay, let's not put all our eggs into one country jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's look elsewhere as well. You're saying, well, actually, maybe there's some advantage to us in sticking with Ecuador. It's what we know, and maybe yeah, yeah. There's some, some great assets to be had. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think Ecuador is where the opportunity lies. You know, it has the same geology, the same mineral endowment as, you know, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia. You know, they're all far more mature um, jurisdictions in terms of exploration and mining. And, you know, Ecuador has the same geology. It just hasn't had the same level of uh, investment in terms of exploration. And I think the, you know, the time is right. I think the government and politically it's a much better, um, I guess, scene right now in Ecuador and, and has been probably for the last 15 to 20 years it's really started to sort of, um, you know, come forward in, in that in that vein. So, yeah, I, I think that Ecuador is the opportunity all of the other jurisdictions in South America. I'm sure there's still a lot more to be found and discovered there, but Ecuador is where the real opportunity is and I think that we're very well established in country now with our team. Um, and our skill set. So I think we should um, capitalize on that. Right. And and I think some of the other companies that have been on um, the program um, with assets in, in Ecuador, they, they, they've talked about it's a little bit about politics again. Um, but I think it's important because we've seen it across sort of South America more broadly over the past, you know, three, four years, um, this whole con conversation around, you know, socialism and, you know, pro mining, anti mining, et cetera, you know, NGOs being sponsored by groups and, in Germany, et cetera, um, to be sort of you know, make things difficult, shall we say. Your, your view, therefore, you're saying we, we're going to stick with um, Ecuador. We think some great assets there, you know, just need to look at that whole west coast of South America um, for sure. You, you feel that it, it's Ecuador's time, I, I'm guessing, is, is, is that what trying to understand? Yeah, you feel uh, it's going to be uh, a I, good time. Well, I think so, and I think with the level of investment that we're seeing now and the majors that are clearly taking that view as well, I mean, they wouldn't be in country if they didn't think that, um, you know, they, like I've said to you already, they have a low appetite for risk and they wouldn't normally go somewhere if they feel like they're going to risk losing hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, for instance, Hancock, who we've just done the deal with at Linderos, I know that they've personally have invested $80 million US in their projects in the north. So a number of these majors are investing considerable amounts of money. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in Ecuador in the last just five years or so. So I think that critical mass of investment there um, just provides certainty for, for us as juniors. Um, and, I, and I guess we're quite a, quite a unique investment proposition. It's ourselves, Titan Minerals. Uh, I think there's two other ASX-listed companies that are um, have projects in Ecuador of these scale, of this type of scale. Um, and, and other than that, there's some TSX listed sort of juniors, mid tiers, but not a lot of a way to get exposure to this opportunity in Ecuador. So we've got a relatively, I guess, first mover advantage in that regard. So, so yeah, I, I think that um, I think it is the time is now for Ecuador. Malik, appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, Sati.